Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this session where we learn about uh, Hebrews chapter 11. We were somewhere midway, and uh, today we will try and complete that and proceed from there. We'll get started, uh, but before that, let's have a word of prayer. So I just want to request someone to pray, pray for today's class that we may receive good understanding of the word of God and also that you know there be no hindrances. So could somebody go ahead and pray, please? Shall I pray, ma'am? Yes, yes, sir. Please. Heavenly and gracious Father God Almighty, we come into your presence with thanksgiving in our heart for a new morning, for a bright, beautiful day, Father, that has come into our lives by your grace. And as we are in your presence, Father, meditating on your word, learning your word, Lord Father, enrich us, Father. Bless ma'am with the words that you need to speak over our lives, Father. Bless all the students who are on the receiving end that we would receive it in its fullness, Father, and that we will be enriched in it, Father, and the word is going to guide us, help us to do the, um, the work that you have called us to do, Father. And Lord, as we are learning about and this, uh, this beautiful uh, passage in Hebrews 11, Father, may it, it teach us, talk to us, Father, and build us up in the most holy faith, Father, because by faith we shall do what you have called us to do, Father. And as we surrender everything into your hands, the technology, the connection, and Lord, everything be in your perfect control. We give you glory, honor, and praise for answering our prayer. And, and in Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ami. Um, so we were looking at the lives of men and women in Scripture, and we saw how they did what they did by faith. So we saw the example of people like uh, Abraham, Sarah, um, you know, Abel, even though there was only one work of faith which is enlisted, God wanted to bring that back, you know, as an account for us to consider and learn from. Uh, and uh, we will continue in, uh, you know, learning about these people. So we were somewhere near, uh, I think, was 60. Uh, Somewhere there is where we stop. 20. 21. Okay, okay, thank you. So uh, we've done 21. Uh, we we'll do 22 now, where uh, we learn about Joseph. That by faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. So, uh, you know, Joseph, we do understand that um, he was in Egypt at the time, but um, the prophetic word which was given to Abraham and his descendants was that they would occupy the promised land. And so, you know, uh, Joseph knew that that was not the uh, destination for him or his descendants, I mean, Egypt. And so he knew that the journey would move on, move forward. And uh, he really wanted uh, his bones to be buried in the land that God would give them. So you know, by faith, there's, there's an instruction that he gave his children. And uh, you know, that is commendable that you know, one continues to believe in the promise, uh, even when they are passing on, knowing that, OK, in my lifetime, I haven't seen it, but it's coming. And I want uh, my children to ensure that when they are in that land, they would uh, you know, take my bones and they would bury there. So there's faith because he hasn't seen the future and yet he believes that God is true to the word of his promise. Similarly, talking about Moses, uh, it is said that when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. So at a time when um, there was danger and the parents of Moses perceived that danger, they still look to God for favor. I mean, um, it's incredible because their son, like everybody else's son, would have uh, been killed. But thank God for the faith that these parents had, that they trusted God and they did um, the most unlikely thing to just you know, uh, securely put him 
uh, in a basket and cause him to float. And uh, then we know that you know it was an act of faith. But God comes into the picture when we take a step of faith. We know how the uh, Pharaoh's daughter noticed him, and you know he was raised up as a child of uh, as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So. Uh, as we continue, verse 24, that's what we see here by faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So again, it, it took faith for his parents to ensure his safety. Um, but when he grew up, you know, having every privilege of the palace, Okay, sorry about that uh, uh, disconnection there. Uh, I got logged out of the class, but uh, let's resume what we were talking about. So we were talking about uh, Moses, his parents, and how they had faith in God. And verse 25 talks about the faith of Moses, that he did not choose to identify with the privileges of the palace, but instead, he chose to identify with who he was, uh, you know, as um, a Jew, and uh, uh, he decided you know, to to do what God wanted him to do, and that's what verse five and uh, twenty six say. Okay, um, so I'm just going to read out those verses. It says choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. So, you know, ultimately, in the journey of these uh, men and women of God, they seem to be focusing on the call of God on their lives, on the eternal rewards. And uh, that is the transition that all of them make in their, in their uh, earthly journey. Uh, and you know their minds are moved away from the temporal things to what is eternal. Uh, so we see that Moses, his reward was not so much uh, all, the, all the glory that existed you know, for him as the son of uh, Pharaoh's daughter, but he wanted what uh, God was going to give as a reward for him and his people to gather. And uh, that takes faith. You know, it takes faith to fulfill the call of God. It takes faith to journey into the call of God. It takes faith to let go of the so called comforts, you know, uh, uh, which may be outside of our call right now. 
Uh, but thank God, you know, Moses had the courage and he also had the faith to do what God wanted him to do. So verses 27 and 28, again, uh, talking about Moses, it says, By faith he forsook Egypt, not sharing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover at the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the first God should touch them. Okay, so just, you know, going on uh, uh, about the faith of Moses and all the events that took place. So I'm not going to go into each of them. It's quite self-explanatory. Verse 29, by faith, now talks about the children of Israel and says they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. So this also is interesting. We saw uh, that the children of Israel, they passed through the Red Sea. It's not like the Egyptians did something different. They did the very same thing to pass through the Red Sea. But what was the different, differentiating factor? Why is it that the Israelites could pass through, but the Egyptians couldn't? You know, one uh, a point that God is trying to make in this passage is faith. Miracles happen when we believe. The Red Sea parted because the children of Israel believed that God could do this. But the Egyptians, they tried to accomplish the same feat. They just couldn't do it because the missing ingredient was faith. And God is showing that to us. And he's saying, when we have faith, we can walk in miracles. We can even pass through those rough patches, rough seasons in our lives and overcome them. So faith is very important. And let's not forget the context of uh, Hebrews 11. It continues to be a word to a discouraged community of Jewish believers. And God does not want them to let go of their faith, even when the going has gotten rough for them. So verses 30 through 31. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. Now, there's no logical explanation to some of these miracles, some of these conquests. How could a mighty fortress come crashing down uh, with people, you know, walking around it for seven days? Now, uh, scientists can try and explain it in a certain way. Architects can try and explain it in a certain way. But whatever we do, you know, the underlying reason, as far as the Bible is concerned, you know, we are told that it's about faith. Faith made the mighty fortress cave in. And even today, you know, as we uh, go against the oppression of the enemy, as we trust God for deliverances, how is it going to happen? By faith, the walls of Jericho will come down. By faith, it says about Rahab that she did not perish with those who did not believe that she had received the spies with peace. So one woman who is from a different community, not even the community of you know God, so to speak, she experienced the protection of God. The protection of God was upon his children. We saw that in the Passover, the way God uh, safeguarded his own people and uh, the others uh, went through perilous times. But how is it that a woman of a different community could experience the protection of God? So even the protection of God was upon someone because of faith. And uh, we know the entire story where they had, you know, put uh, forth, uh, uh, you know, she, she put forth a, a red a rope or red a ribbon. Uh, but, you know, in essence, it, it's like a shadow of Rahab actually making use of the blood of Jesus. Even though she did not understand the meaning uh, of that you know, red rope or ribbon that she was putting out, that was actually her hiding in the, in the blood of Jesus, which protected her. And so people who have walked by faith have experienced the protective hand of the Lord on their lives. Now, we will talk about 
many other people who have walked by faith and experienced victories. Uh, verse 32, and what shall what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of, he says, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, also the da also David and Samuel and the prophets. What did they all do? Who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weaknesses were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. So many mighty works have been accomplished because of faith that people carry. We know the story of Gideon, who boldly destroyed uh, uh, you know, pagan idols during his time. Uh, he went against the Midianite army and saw victory. We uh, know about Barak and his dramatic victory over the Canaanites, Samson, who defeated the Philistines, Jephthah, who defeated the Ammonites, David, a man of uh, remarkable faith, and you know, so many victories of David that we could talk about. So uh, put together, there are many, many mighty uh, children of God, such as you can add more names because it said subdued nations. Under subdued nations, we can talk about kings such as uh, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah, uh, Josiah. So there are so many people who actually made things happen for the kingdom of God. But what was the determining factor? It was faith. Because of faith, it says, they subdued kingdoms, they worked out righteousness, they obtained promises, they even stopped the mouth of lions. Remember uh, uh, Daniel, that he was able to, to survive in, in the den of hungry lions, uh, quench the violence of fire. Think about Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Even the fire could not, it could not forget about scorching, but it did not even touch them. Nothing really happened to them. And it was only because of uh, the faith that they carried in God, escaped the edge of the sword, uh, like David in his battle with, with uh, Goliath and, uh, you know, many other. Hello, Pastor. It's, it's frozen. Oh, we can't hear you anymore. Uh, yes. Sorry about that. Say thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, back now. Just pick up from where we stopped. So now we were talking about uh, all the wonderful things that have happened because of people who put their faith in the Lord. Uh, continuing on from... Um, you know, the mid part of verse 35 all the way to verse 38. Uh, it says, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings. Yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. So, very interesting. We are moving from a list of uh, very um, obvious victories, okay, subduing nations, working righteousness, stopping the mouth of lions and surviving the fight. So all of that sounds, uh, uh, you know, triumphant to us. But here is another list which doesn't sound very promising or doesn't sound uh, like the people who have gone through this have 
truly conquered for God because it says they've gone through torture, um, they, um, you know, they've gone through markings, uh, scourgings. They were in chains. They were imprisoned. They were stoned, sawn in two. Um, it just doesn't sound that reassuring uh, or strengthening at all. But I want to remind us that yes, there are people who have gone through. Uh, very, very difficult phases in their lives. And uh, even if we look at the end of their lives, um, uh, even, uh, you know, people like Isaiah, it is, it is said, you know, according to reliable tradition, uh, it is said that uh, he was also sought and, and killed. Uh, so it's, it's a tough end that people who have trusted in God have faced. But here's the reality that we must settle in our hearts. You see, it's more about walking with faith uh, that blesses God's heart. And yes, if we, uh, we come through victorious, even better. But for whatever reason, we have a finite mind, uh, we are mortal beings, and we don't understand everything. Why is it that some people, like Abel, even Abel, why is it that he died? Why didn't we see him resurrected? Yes, God is commenting his faith, his action of faith. Uh, but why wasn't he alive? They, they, these are all questions that arise in our minds. And we ask questions about others in the Bible. But you see, God has put them in the hall of faith. And uh, he wants us to know that even at times when we have walked in faith but we've not seen the so-called victory that you know we were we were looking for for whatever reason there could be thousands of reasons now we don't know uh, or we may never know but it's enough for us to know that god still commends our faith we, we could have tried and failed but if we have stepped out by faith, what does the Bible say? It says, yeah, even if there is a seeming uh, defeat, God still is happy about our walk of faith, our fight of faith, our journey of faith. So in his sight, it's not a failure. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, at least you journeyed in faith. Uh, and it's not at least that I commend you. It's great that you've journeyed in faith. And so the important thing is hold on to faith. Keep the faith because God sees it, sees it and God commends it. Even when we are going through uh, a discouraging and a disappointing uh, time in, in, our, in our lives, we have to keep the faith. And that's what God is calling us to. So it was 39 and 40. It says, and all these having obtained a good testimony through faith. So what did they have? Good testimony through faith. And the scripture itself says, did not receive the promise. So they didn't see the fulfillment of the promise. Verse 40, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. So, you know, uh, it, it, it simply goes to say that there, there are greater things we don't understand. And uh, there are reasons why they may not have seen the fulfillment of the promise, but uh, we, of course, can uh, learn from their testimony of faith. So let me just pause here for a moment. We can um, see if there is anything to talk about, anything to discuss, and then uh, we move ahead with chapters 12 and 13. Anything about faith or um, the testimony of all these people? that we heard about. Or if something impressed you or touched you. OK, so it's probably. Uh, being digested, so we leave it at that uh, right now. 
we'll move ahead to chapter 12 here. Uh, so chapter 12, uh, once again, is uh, an invitation to keep running the race. Uh, and the passage is a very crucial one, a very important one. Uh, again, we can talk out for hours about the safe passage, but I'll just try and keep it as uh, succinct as possible. Um, could somebody read from verses 1 through 5, please? 12, Hebrews 12, 1 through 5. Yeah. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us burn with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who hear from sinners such was the allergy against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sins? My son, do not regard rivalry for the spirit of the world, nor be weary when it be reproved by him. So there is an invitation to journey with God the way people ahead of this community have done it. So that's where the cloud of witnesses is applicable. So when he says, we are therefore, you see, there's a continuation. We also, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, which has to do with those who have lived their life in faith and are now in heaven he says lay aside every weight and the sin so we uh, understand that in a race when one is running to be fast it's important to let go of anything that may uh, be heavy uh, when we look at people who compete in, in uh, uh, the olympics and you know who are, who are running for medals they go to the extent of uh, uh, scientifically picking the clothes they wear because they want the least weight. They 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 want to uh, you know cut through cut through the uh, air and and just be really. They want to be super fast, and uh, that's the way we as believers should be, because there are things in our journey. Uh, that can really bog us down and God doesn't want that. And so the author is saying, just let go of anything that makes you sluggish because uh, it can even be dangerous. So he uses the word weight, right? Weight, um, things like uh, discouragement, we've already said disappointment. And then he points to sin. Sin, what is sin? He's talked about unbelief earlier. No, he, he's talked about a lack of faith earlier, the way the children of Israel were. And uh, now uh, he's saying, let's not be people of unbelief. No, let's not be people who very easily begin to doubt God when things have gotten tougher. So he says that uh, uh, sin, now it's sin, we can also consider so many other things. Disobedience to God, uh, wrong lifestyle. Um, you know, wrong words. So sin is a huge category there. But whatever sin is there in our lives, what will it do? It will hinder us from accomplishing what God wants us to do. It will hinder us from finishing the race. So he uses terms like it will um, ensnare. So the Greek word that, um, you know, okay, the Greek word, uh, I won't say it, but what does it mean? The Greek word uh, means that it's uh, you know something that will entangle uh, something that is dangerous so it, uh, it snares us uh, and we must let go so that we are able to finish the race that is set before us run the race which is set before us and the race again that term race there from the greek language uh, word agona uh, is used for conflict or struggle so you know, there are struggles uh, of, of life and uh, we must 
press in, press on and be sure to finish the race. And he also points to endurance. Endurance, we talked about it in the last class. Uh, it's the ability to hold on. Okay, it's, it's an ability to stay put under pressure. And he says, you need to run with what? Run with endurance. Run without giving up. And when we have patience, you know, it will master those temporary uh, feelings of, you know, discouragement or whatever, distraction that we may have. And another beautiful thing is he invites us to work from the example uh, or learn from the example of our Lord Jesus. So that's why he says, looking unto Jesus. Or you, you look at the example that he has set for us. He's the author. He's the finisher of our faith. What did he do? He endured the cross. He could have given up, but he did not give up. He stayed put to finish what God wanted him to do. But what was his motivating factor? Something that we can learn from the attitude of Jesus. The present is hard, but he was looking at the reward of the future. That was the way Jesus endured the cross. So what is the reward of the future? He was looking at the fact that he would uh, be obedient to the Father in uh, going up to the cross. He uh, believed that, uh, you know, this is the call of his life, right? To bring redemption for mankind. He was happy that people will experience salvation. Uh, he was also happy that once he is done with what God has called him to do, the next step for him is to go up to heaven and sit at the right hand of God. So there were a lot of wonderful things on the other side of the cross. And that's what he was looking at. You know, it's just like how we face an exam. We know that the exam is difficult, but you know we're looking at uh, using our certificate to go on and and you know, uh, do great things in our, in our career. And so that's the way we must endure through the present seasons of life. And that's what the author is saying. And he's saying, look, uh, learn from Jesus. Our faith starts with him. And to keep the faith as you consider him, you know, you know that you must be looking at bigger, better things. And in the book of Hebrews, he's already explained uh, so much about our, our Lord Jesus and how he's greater than all the Jewish, uh, you know, patriarchs that they were aware of. And he's already explained how the traditions that they were used to are nothing, or they're rather shadows as compared to the fullness that God has already brought through our Lord Jesus Christ. So all these wonderful things, and he wants them to focus on the good and not get so caught up in the struggles, you know, the agona of today so uh, that's his word of encouragement and he you know also states that we have not yet resisted to bloodshed striving against sin so he's saying look there's so much to face when you are walking you know uh, when you're living for god there's so many things to face but let's not be people who are uh, you know like sort of like very weak that the the smallest thing that happens you know, it it uh, causes us to turn back. So that's his word of encouragement. Now, we move on to another very, very important section. And that is about God chastening us. And uh, this also is something that we must understand properly. So uh, I want to request someone to please read from verses 5 through 11. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 to 11. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had 
human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect, shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of the spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful nevertheless afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Agni. So uh, here is the concept of chastening. Uh, it also tells us that you know God is a God who brings correction when required and the term chastening is used. So if we look up that word you know, um, or, or rather look up the word chastisement in the Greek here, uh, it, it is uh, something like pahidia, and it means education, training, nurture. So we mustn't understand the chastening of God, the chastisement of God as punishment, as some do. But very clearly, the author here says, yes, there are going to be times when God sees that we are not aligned or repeatedly. We, we are uh, uh, misaligning ourselves, he will try to correct us. But this correction should be understood like the correction of a father that wants to nurture us, that wants to train us, educate us for a better life. So uh, God's chastening is like that. And it's actually the goodness of God that he even chooses to correct us. Isn't it? Because uh, here in this passage, uh, we are told that if we are not corrected, then the the real father, right? A real father has a heart to to see that children do better than them, and so they want to impart life lessons, and that's the place from where correction actually comes. And God loves us so much that He will correct us, and that is for our good. And we are told that we must yield to what the Lord is saying. We must yield to what the Lord is speaking. Uh, of course, when chastisement comes, when correction comes, it's never easy. But uh, we must see the benefits of being obedient to God because what's it going to do? It's going to yield uh, the fruit of peaceable fruit of righteousness. It's going to help us become more like Jesus. So it will help us uh, be molded into the character, the virtues of Jesus Christ. We will become, um, uh, you know, like Jesus in holiness. So there are so many uh, wonderful outcomes of yielding to God, especially through a time of chastening. But we must look at it that way. And we must not think that, you know, God doesn't like me or God... Uh, God is so angry with me. He wants to, um, he doesn't want a relationship with me. We understand it in all these, these uh, uh, you know, other, uh, other ways. But that's not the point. When God corrects us, it's because of his heart of love for us. And we must receive it and quickly align ourselves to what the spirit of God is saying. Right? Uh, let's uh, move ahead, verses 12 and 13. So that's in connection with what we said so far. Could somebody read it, please? Verses 12 and 13. Yes, ma'am. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Thank you. So, we see here that uh, the author is continuing to Make a strong call to obedience. So what does he say? He says, yes, there are all these possibilities to go away from the faith, um, you know, to uh, give up. And so he talked about faith. He talked about endurance. He also talked about the love of God, that the chastening of God is because of his love for us. And so now he says, come on, because of all this, you get stronger. Okay. So uh, it. In saying that, he uses terminology such as strengthen your hands. 
or uh, strengthen your feeble knees. And he says, make a straight path for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. So he's saying, get ready to be obedient and not neglect the salvation of God. So overall, verses 12 and 13 are just the author saying, get ready to be obedient. Okay, so it's like a pictorial language, uh, hands, knees, and all that. But basically, he's saying, get ready, be obedient, uh, always be ready. So readiness to work for the Lord, readiness to move for the Lord, readiness to live for the Lord. And that's, that's the call that he places on them. So uh, let's quickly look at uh okay let's let's take a break i think it won't do justice to verses 14 through 17 so we'll come back and we will uh talk about the following verses here and then we will look at uh, uh chapter 30 uh hopefully we we'll, we can move on to the next book of the bible which is the book of james okay so thank you everyone for connecting and sorry for uh, some of the interruptions that we've had today i hope it hasn't hindered the flow of what we are learning so uh, take a nice break we shall come back we'll meet at uh, 10 thank you